I think, uh, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, this edition of This Week with the Communist Party. Scott, another week has come and gone. Another week has come and gone. Still haven't had the Mueller report. Say what? Still haven't seen the full Mueller report. Uh, no, no, but there are a lot of questions being raised. By the way, you know, I sent out an email blast from the party this week, yesterday, I think. And somebody wrote me back and said, why are you keep sending? That's not the issue. The issue is Social Security, Medicare. People don't care about Trump and his honesty. And I was like, yeah. really? Like there's this, there's this whole tendency, I think, and it, it's built into capitalism to think that everything is in competition with everything else, right? Mm. Every issue is, oh, that's not the, the, that's just a distraction from this other thing, right? Uh, the fight for, you know, um, the fight against sexual harassment in the workplace, it's not the major issue, it's just a distraction from the class struggle or, you know, no, all of these things, they work together, all the classes. Hello. Especially considering half the workforce are women. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a, both a class and a gender issue. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I don't believe, you know, they keep saying all the American people don't care about Trump. They don't care about his lying. They don't care about his sexism. They don't care about whether or not a foreign country was. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that for a minute. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. On the other hand, I think that there was a little bit of truth in it to the degree that the basic day-to-day -day issues of survival and having health care and mm -hmm. having a roof over your head, being able to take care of your children and family are the basic motivating issues. A, How to balance a, that. There's a, a class question underneath. Like for 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 the what you might call you know the, the anti-Trump forces in the ruling class. It's a, they, they want to keep this very narrow, focused just on, you know, a, a specific legal question. Can we impeach Trump? Whatever. But the, the working class approach, the people's approach is like the, the American people care about fairness, right? And they care about it, whether it's, you know, the question of is our president being held to the same standards that, you know, I'm held to in my job, uh, right. but also a question of is the economy fair to working people. So those are, you know, there's a there's a working class approach, I think, to the the question of, of, of Trump and his his wrongdoing. And there's a there's a ruling class, much more narrow, limited one. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Anyway, folks, we're calling on everybody to call on the attorney general to get the goddamn report out, send it out, don't redact it. Um, let's see exactly what was going on. And that's a very important democratic fight. Because as I said to my comrade who sent me the notes, you know, the struggle against these fascist minded people is central to the struggle for democracy and uh, social progress. Let's not, let's not forget about that. How about the news this week about Mr. Biden and the women who are objecting? What's your take on that? Um, I think you know, nobody, nobody is above scrutiny, above having to account for their actions. Um, you know, we're in a, a time when uh, women are, are standing up and saying, listen, you can't just, you know, uh, touch us, stand close to us, be creepy, whatever, and, and assume we'll let it go. Um, I don't put my hands on people, Scott. I've never done that. I don't put my hands on women. I know that there are boundaries. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just don't really get it. I, I don't, you know, um, that kind of, uh, and, and not as saying always generational, but I. But no, know. no, it's not. Like there, there are, I think the basic boundaries of human decency and, and respect for people are, they change obviously over time, but they're, but it's not like, you know, uh, not being creepy is some brand new thing that the youth invented. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, uh, it'll play out. We'll see uh, what happens. But respect is respect. Um, and, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta, that's, that's the beginning of equality and uh, not the end. So, um, you know, also uh, this week we put uh, on our Facebook page a meme around the 
issue of fighting to save uh, Medicare. And there are two dimensions of it. One is that Trump wants to cut $184 billion from uh, uh, Medicare over the next 10 years, which would cripple it. Mm -hmm. And the other is Medicare for all. Now he's backed up a little bit, at least verbally, on the issue of not trying to get rid of uh, or put forward a new uh, bill around healthcare until after 2020, but the suit on the Justice Department is still alive and well. Yeah. So the danger there is clear and present. Yeah. So I hope people will share that meme and help get the word out and not lose their vigilance. How is the pre-convention discussion going? Um, it seems to be going real well. Um, yeah, I think we've mostly updated the, the page with the, the list of links. Uh, what I'm really gratified to see is that people are, are writing in to respond to, to posts. We're getting a little back and forth, which is great. Um, you recently uh, submitted a, a response to something on the issue of internationalism, I believe. Well, yeah, I mean, there was a uh, article that was put forward on our website, uh, cpusa.org. And by the way, that's where you should go to look at our pre-convention uh, discussion calling for the resurrection of the communist international. And there's been quite a little bit of discussion about that. Um, and I was uh, concerned about some of the uh, notions that were put forward in that article. I mean, um, because while we are completely, and I would underline completely in favor of international communist and uh, unity, uh, I think that the forms that it takes is uh, an issue for uh, much thought and consideration. And the fact that the international uh, was dismantled in the early 40s, uh, one needs to really take a look at it because it wasn't just because of the you know, approach of the Soviet Union, the CPSU under Stalin, that, wasn't, that was part of it, but it wasn't, in my view, even the major part, the major part was that each country is different. Each working class is different. Um, each uh, uh, democratic movement has its own unique features, history, and so on. You can't direct that from an international center. You just can't do it, it's too complex. For so, example, um, the, the question of the right wing uh, works differently, I think, in the United States, for example, than in. Um, in some part in, in Western Europe. Uh, here we have, you know, uh, one might say that the, um, after the Civil War, uh, because, of, because Reconstruction was never completed, um, the, the Confederacy was never fully dismantled and sort of went underground and festered, uh, which gives, you know, we, we now see one of our two ruling parties as a neo-Confederate, a resurgence of the old Confederate power, which is not the same way that the, you know, the, the fascist leaning and fascist right in Europe works necessarily. And so the Comintern, um, along with some comrades here, developed a concept of, uh, with respect to what happened in the United States in the South of the uh, Black Belt uh, self-determination, self-determination for the Black Belt that there were several counties that stretched from Florida up through uh, uh, Virginia, which constituted a separate nation, which had the right to self-determination. Imagine that in conditions of apartheid in the South, you are conceding to the notion that black and white should be separate. You understand? Rather, yeah. I mean, and so it, it, it was a um, very but wrong also, and idea. That black belt thesis as a an overemphasis on the sort of national particularity, uh, right? Um, rather failing to understand the the integration of of uh, the the African Americans in that region at you know within the larger context of the United States and the class struggle and the and and the struggle for the U.S nation state to become a nation. Um, and uh, that democratic, bourgeois democratic revolution, mm -hmm. which in some respects uh, isn't completely uh, over, or if it is over, it just ended in the 60s 
when Hillary the Democratic had Revolution their housing itself. Act were passed. I'm sorry. The Democratic Revolution itself doesn't, in a certain, it won't, won't be fully complete as long as capitalism exists, right? The, well, yes, because you still have institutionalized racism, you know, uh, very much so. It's still very much a part of the economy. But here's the thing. One of Lenin's basic idea was the law of uneven development. You know, that capitalism develops unevenly, not uniformly, you know, which means again, that each country is in a different stage of development. So one of the articles that was put forward said, without reservation, and I almost fell out of my seat, that there are no national roads to socialism. And I'm like, huh? What are you talking about? The only path through which socialism attempted to come into the world was with regard to understanding and taking into account its national particularities. That's what happened in Russia. That's what happened in China. That's what happened in Cuba, Vietnam, and so on and so forth. So, um, and so if, if there are, let me just finish this thought. If there are no national roads to socialism, then what road is there? An international one? And what does that mean? Are you talking about Trotsky's permanent revolution? Is that where you're going with this? You know, and if that's where you're going, look at what happened in Eastern Europe after the uh, Second World War, because socialism was brought to most of those countries under the force of arms of the Red Army, with the exception of Czechoslovakia. So, and the result was, soon as the Berlin Wall fell, socialism in each of those countries fell. Why? Because you can't impose it from outside. No, it's not going to happen. So, I, I'm going to... I'm, I'm not a scholar of history, but I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit on that one. I mean, there were strong communist movements in those countries that who, who had been the anti-Nazi, the resistance forces in World War II, right? Uh, so it wasn't just the Red Army rolling in and, and imposing it. There was also, there were forces who had been, you know, through the Comintern, uh, part of the, the push for socialism on an international Except that, you know, look, Hungary was a fascist country and there was an attempt to, to seize power by Béla Kuhn and others in 1919. Scottish failed, okay? Mm -hmm. And and the uh, even the uh, German Communist Party was uh, weakest in the eastern part of the country. Mm -hmm. It was virtually wiped out, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, you had, you, you had um, uh, Czechoslovakia, which elected, a communist government in 1948, 1949. And then in, in um, Yugoslavia, on the other hand, there were partisans who, who had under Tito's leadership who had successfully yes. staged a, a guerrilla war against the Nazi occupations. But in the other countries, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, no, I don't, I don't think so. Yugoslavia, I mean, no. Yugoslavia has fared no better in the early 90s than the, the countries that had been. That's true. Uh, so it, it wasn't just the Soviet. Oh, I didn't mean to suggest that. What I'm trying to suggest is that each country will come to socialism in its own way, you know? And yeah. you can't bum rush the process, you know? You can't impose it from outside, you know? It is not going to happen as a result of international civil war, you know, world war. It's not going to happen as a result of, of uh, armies coming to the aid of, you know, without respect to what's going on in each country. You saw what happened in Bolivia with Che and so on and so forth. So, and what, you know, Cuba um, sent 250,000 people to Angola. No, that can't be right. That's way too many. They um, sent um, troops they to assist MPLA and the yeah. ANC. Uh, uh, and yeah. the freedom fighters when South Africa invaded, you know, in order to prevent. Yeah. So um, that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, it, it's not, uh, it wasn't in the first place an attempt to bring about a social no. revolution. And it was a, an attempt to preserve a national democratic victory by the MPLA. So we're talking about, you know, two yeah, very different uh, uh, things. I but do the think main... we have to recognize that, so there, there's a very strong uh, 
nationalist pressure, especially right now uh, from the right. Um, uh, America first is a very tempting slogan, make America great again. And I think we do, we do have to be aware over the, the course of the second half of the 20th century, the ways in which national chauvinism uh, was used to um, fracture uh, the, the working class and, and socialist movement, uh, the, the, its connection to anti-communism. And as you said earlier, we have to be very, very clear and intentional about um, the, the working class of the whole world is united um, it needs to be united or has the same interest in fighting capitalism because capitalism is what will the forms of those unit the forms exactly. that, that, that that unity will take you know specifically and uh and it to me uh, i think experience has shown it, it has to be on specific issues you mm -hmm. know uh like job losses uh the environment um uh, you know health care uh, things like this uh, with uh, on the basis of bilateral and multilateral agreements between trade unions and, and parties with the insistence on the independence and autonomy of each party and country participating in it. Mm -hmm. One of the problems that you have is that, you know, some parties have historically intervened and mm -hmm. that history ain't that all that long ago. You know, it might have even been yesterday in the mm -hmm. internal affairs of other parties, thinking that they got the best answer to what's going on in another country. No, I don't think so. Not happening. And that's one of the been the chief obstacles to greater coordination of work in the international movement. And it's actually something that, that I find myself responding a lot when, when people write into the mailbag, for example, about um, aren't you going to condemn what, you know, this country has done or this party has done or we don't, you know, that's not our role. We can um, engage in a comradely way. We can be critical in a comradely way, but, you know, we don't, uh, you know, denounce or support. It's not, that's not our business. That's not our role. Um, and particularly coming from the United States. Yeah. Hello, we're the main imperialist country in the world, you know, you know, have a, incredibly long and troubling history of intervention in other countries. So let's not try to tell other parties and what, what, to, do. what to do, no. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's very dangerous. So tell me about this upcoming webinar on um, uh, international capital and the struggle of the- Yeah, so April 14th, for, we're- um, uh, we're doing the third in our series of uh, webinars on the new uh, draft program of the party. Uh, the subject is unity against the extreme right in the electoral arena and beyond, but it's also going to include um, the need for international working class and, and democratic unity, mm. unity of working class and democratic forces worldwide against um, the growing danger of environmental catastrophe and nuclear war. Um, so we'll talk about um, the uh, division in the ruling class, the different uh, strategic tendencies. We'll talk about what we mean by the extreme right, what forces are in it, what's the connection between the sort of corporate boardroom and the neo-Nazi movement. Um, and we'll talk about the sort of international, uh, international solidarity versus international capital. Um, I heard a, a brief report on some of these uh, notions the other day and I was a little bit confused by it. Maybe you can clarify it. For example, they said the Koch industry, Coke industry, however you pronounce those the guys' names, were part of the extreme right and so on and so forth. But then I uh, understood, and I may be mistaken, that they didn't support Trump in the last election, though they did support the Tea Party previously to that. So um, what's so up with that? But they certainly, but then they certainly also supported the uh, appointment of, of Gorsuch and Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. Um, so there's like Trump has been a is a particular piece of this, you know, reactionary fascist uh, tendency within the ruling class. But he's not like it's not as simple as just like Trump and the people who support him versus you know Hillary Clinton and the people who supported her. It, it's much more. And these are these are analytical categories, not 
you know, part well, let of me ask you a question. If if Koch is opposed to Trump, are we in a united front with the Koch brothers? Certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't see it. I mean, maybe maybe there's somebody out there who'll say, oh, careful, the Koch brothers are our allies in the fight against the Trump regime. Um, mm. From what I've seen, they haven't uh, they haven't been willing to actually, you know, do anything against Trump except, you know, um, publish editorials through their think tanks about. You know, well, let me sharpen the question a little bit. There was an editorial written in the New York Times about an unnamed administration member who claim to be part of the resistance. Are we in a united front with that person, be it a man or a woman? So here's, here's my thinking on this. Um, the way this is, the way it goes, the way we, we think it's supposed to go, the way it is developing, the, the democratic movement, the core of it is the working class and, and the movements of, of oppressed peoples um, fighting for, for democratic rights. That's the driving force. That's that's where it's happening. Are there forces within the ruling class that you know are drawn to that occasionally? Maybe, but there are also forces who are part of the I would consider part of the extreme right who support almost every point for point every every policy of the Trump regime, but just don't like that Trump is he's too unstable. He's too unpredictable. He's um, so that. You know, getting rid of Trump is one thing; it would be a step. But but it's not just Trump. There's a whole agenda. There's a whole infrastructure that existed before he came to prominence. Let me ask you another related question: Do you think that the Popular Front is a source of revisionism and reformism in the in the uh, communist movement? I think ev everything has to be seen as a terrain of class struggle. Um, so there are, you know, the, the bourgeoisie would certainly like the whole notion. They, they, their vision is a, a broad front under their direction against Donald Trump very narrowly, right? Um, our vision of the all people's front is a front led by the working class and democratic movements that a section of the ruling class may be drawn to into an unstable, temporary, provisional, whatever alliance, uh, right? So again, th there are, yes, the, 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 there is always a danger that the, you know, the, that bourgeois vision of, oh, you know, we're all in this together, class differences, you know, that, that gets shunted aside. Sure, you know, that's what they're trying to do. We resist that. That's not our understanding of it. Correct. I agree with you. There are dangers, uh, certainly, and uh, there are dangers of illusions, you know, that, that developed uh, under the Obama administration, you know. Uh, some folks thought he was the second coming of the first son. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, opportunism, you know, um, has always been a problem in the working class movement. It developed uh, during the time of Marx and Engels. Both of them polemicized against it. It developed during the time of uh, Lenin. He polemicized against it. This was before, mind you, popular front concepts had uh, emerged. And, and, but and, the notion of the popular front is really based in, in two tactics, I would argue. Yes, yes. And uh, the, the idea that in the fight against reaction, the working class needs allies, including allies amongst the uh, temporary alliances with the ruling bourgeois elements. We're not afraid of that. Our goal is to put a working class imprint on it to for, fight for working class interests in and through it. And we talk about in, influences on the, on the working class and, and what's the biggest danger sort of ideologically right now. You know, I don't think there's a contest yet. Yeah, yes, there, there is, you know, that, that infiltration seepage of bourgeois ideology, maybe bourgeois ideological. Hey, it's a bourgeois town, I keep telling you. The, 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 by far, to my mind, the greater danger is the influence of, of fascist ideology and its ability to use uh, white supremacy and national chauvinism to to split the working class. 
to me that that's the major ideological danger the you know uh the danger from the liberals is 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 much less so the lesson for today is each country is different that there are laws of uneven development you got to develop your revolution based on your own country's traditions and history you know uh number one and number two that uh international unity is important it has to take place around specific uh, uh issues uh and number three that the fight against the extreme right is a necessary uh and an inevitable stage of the fight right now and that our goal is to put a working class imprint on it. I think that does it for the week. Uh, yes. uh, I did want to mention, um, you know, we wanted to have uh, one of our, uh, one of the producers, uh, authors, editors of our new youth run podcast to uh, appear, but they were. The unable. Spectre. Is it, it's called The Spectre, oh, the right? Spectre. Yeah. Um, you Check can it out at cpusa.org. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's going to be really good. I, I was able to sort of watch them uh, at work a little bit. And it was really a, a, a cool thing to watch this come together and watch these these young comrades. Um, You're but standing up. It's also on our Facebook page. Yep. Check it out, The Spectre. You know, uh, Michael was here uh, uh, talking about it a couple of week, weeks ago. So we encourage you to listen to it, share your views, uh, share it. Episode in a couple weeks. Help, 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 help get the word out. All right, man. So that's it. That's We're it. Done. We should have a discussion though at some point about the. Uh, uh, the nation state and its its role in the current configuration of capitalism. So I think Next we, week, we have an exhaust we, camp, but we, we, we will uh, debate it because that's a hot issue too. Because there are a lot of political implications. I read up on your Lenin mm -hmm. and Kotsky and the notion of ultra imperialism. It's a very important critique that he makes. Might change your mind about a few things. <laughs> Might not. We'll see how it goes. Take right. care. Talk to you. Talk to you later.